All right, welcome everyone. Get seated, seminar students, the four or five of you, you have the judging forms. Careers are at stake here. If you are unfamiliar with what Five Slides is all about, those of you in Zoom land and here in person, this is it. My name is Adam Johnston. I've won this too many times and I'm no longer allowed to play. So Dr. Inglefield made me, it's not actually true. So I'm the seminar coordinator. So I've set everything up. Our five contestants are here. I'll give you a quick orientation to how this works. Um, I've got everyone's slides, hopefully. We'll see. Um, so quick orientation, if you're unfamiliar, this is the most important thing that we do as a department. <laughs> also, we have real seminar presentations that many of you have never been to, and you should attend, starting with the week after spring break, Gigi's presentation for a senior seminar. Please everyone come to that. Um, uh, this is not serious, but it's high stakes. We're thrilled that we could prevent it, pre uh, present it for you. <laughs> no one else could prevent it, so we're presenting it. Um, and you'll notice that the losers of previous presentations are not here, so they must have lost their jobs. That's the only thing we can imagine. Uh, the other thing to rem uh, as a reminder is that this is a good example of how not to give a good seminar. Uh, we also want to show you that um, if your seminar goes downhill at some point, it's gonna be okay. And you'll see that uh, pretty soon. Okay, a few other things. Uh, each of our presenters who are here at the front row have, have created a five slide deck. That five slide deck is going to be presented by someone else. That someone else has not seen that five slide deck. What could happen? What could possibly go wrong? Well, everything. The uh, order has been determined and I've actually set this up. Let's see if this plays. Luck of the draw order for our five stars. Oh, this deck is shuffled. It's not coming through. It's great audio though. Okay. So yeah, okay. So here I am shuffling the deck. Now I'm gonna draw cards. I'm drawing a card that is for Brad. He draws a six. Stacy draws a jack. Armstrong draws another number, five, I think. Ingleston draws something else. And then Sol picks one off the bottom of the deck. These are then ordered. I'll show you what that order is. This was done. Um, several times before I got the order I wanted. <laughs> and here it is. So Dr. Soul is going to have to go first. He'll be presenting Dr. Armstrong's slides. Armstrong then presents Carol's slides. Carol then presents Inglefield's slides. Inglefield then presents Palin's slides. Palin then presents Soul's slides. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> your microphone. I'll prep your slides. All right. <laughs> so these are pointers. What are these? Uh -huh. No, oh, there we go. Lame. Oh, that's a laser. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All righty. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to present today a uh, topic that I've been doing research on extensively for quite a long time, and that is the viability of doing space flight um, for uh, rescuing our planet and other sorts of issues. And so I want to discuss the limits that we have to interstellar space travel, especially the dollar signs when it comes down to it, because that's really what matters. So if we can go to the next slide <clears throat> someday, 
Should I hit him? Come on. All right. So um, there are a variety of limitations to interstellar uh, travel here. And uh, first of all, we have to keep in mind that you can't travel faster than the, uh, the speed of light. Uh, so that's going to uh, cause us a serious bit of problems. Uh, the other thing we have to realize is that there's no such thing as a Holtzman engine. And so that's really good because I have no idea what that is. <laughs> and so as a result, it's always been very, very handy that we don't have one um, there. <clears throat> but uh, we do know that matter and antimatter will result in the velocity being equal to C. Um, the downside to that is that you do need to have infinite energy to get to that usage of energy with the, um, with the matter and antimatter reaction that you got. And so that is going to result in a total travel time limitation of the speed of light. The uh, lack of the, uh, of the Holtzman engine uh, deals with the fact that the fuel that's required to reach a given speed doesn't depend on that engine because we don't know what it is. Um, and that uh, the, the fact that we can't travel faster than the speed of light uh, deals with the fact that the energy re required to get there is infinite. And so that's by, uh, by the, uh, the basic laws of uh, special relativity. So you can't reach that speed. And that's what's happening here is uh, this <clears throat> V over C, as we approach the speed of light, what we find out is that uh, your mass gets heavier and heavier, requiring you to, uh, to have more and more energy to push you forward. And uh, that is going to make it impossible to reach the speed of light, even without such a stupid engine. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to our next slide, please. Okay. Whoa. <clears throat> okay. So when you do a trip like this, you have to decide who, who and what you're going to bring with you. And so um, the first thing we got to do is we got to make sure that we bring enough food for us to be able to get the job done. And so uh, as we bring that food along with us, what we find out is that when we take things like, um, like paramecium's and try and turn them into food sources, it looks like pizza. And um, the reason why that looks red is because it's going away from you at nearly the speed of light. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, you don't need any water since we, 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 whatever we bring in, we put back out again. So we're just going to, you know, we're just going to keep using that. But in particular, since we don't need any at all, we're just going to desiccate. And uh, that, what that does is it reduces your mass. And that earlier one where we had the mass ratio, your mass ratio goes down because you have less mass because you've desiccated. Now, it is very important that we have something to do that will keep us um, entertained on this journey. And uh, what I have discovered is that it's much, much easier to bring the internet with you because it has no mass, um, which is really, really cool. The, uh, the downside is, is that as you try to communicate with the internet while moving at nearly the speed of light, it does make the data rate get a little bit wonky. Um, and so uh, that is an ongoing problem. And that does turn out to where the strawberry is actually can be substantially better uh, in free, when you're weightless and in space travel, a free floating strawberry and a rubber band is hours of entertainment. <laughs> and so uh, you can easily get away with that. <clears throat> so the fuel issue is really what comes down to all the problem an awful lot of these things because getting off the ground uh, takes an enormous amount of fuel. And then once you start to go up into speed, um, you'll take, uh, you know, it, in order to reach the speed of light or nearly close to it, you have to have quite a bit of, uh, of uh, fuel to do that. And that's where this guy comes in right here. And so what Robbie's going to do is Robbie's going to create an antimatter system for us. And since you have matter and antimatter, well, the weight of one cancels out the weight of the other, right? Um, and so uh, that means that you don't have to have any fuel mass with you. Um, all right, so that takes care of the whole weight issue right there. All right, let's go on to our next slide. All right, here. So <clears throat> for an eight year trip with a crew of 10, and we choose 10 very importantly because that's the number of fingers that we have. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, that's why we choose those numbers. It's, it's really based on the human dynamic. Um, <clears throat> so Here's what we've got that we have to bring with us. Notice that the ship is dry. That's because we didn't bring any water with us um, so that we can desiccate. So uh, that makes that number a pretty reliable number to work with because it is dry there. Um, it's a whole lot like Kentucky. Um, and so uh, you know the whole state is dry. In this case, that's just gonna be the ship. And so that makes that a little bit easier. 
So uh, what we have to figure out is the amount of this stuff that we need to be able to get the job done. Um, in the case of the, uh, the crew, we have a, 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 a specific weight. Uh, we're gonna reduce that weight by desiccating them. Um, so that will drop that down to around about uh, probably 200 uh, or so, um, because we are an awful lot of us, it's just wasted as water um, there. The, uh, we can reduce this substantially um, by using the, uh, the, the, the um, paramecium pizza um, and letting it just grow. And so what we found is that by putting this stuff in our refrigerators and just leaving it there for a prolonged period of time, it gains mass. And, um, and so our goal is to just slowly eat it at about the same rate that it grows. And uh, that way we'll be about right. So <clears throat> that will keep this as a constant value here, make that a little bit easier to deal with. The, uh, the entertainment, we do have to add about another 10 grams for the rubber band. Um, and then we'll have ourselves a pretty good system there. All right, if we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> all right, so when it comes down to it, we have to pay for all of this, okay? So we pay for this by consuming all the electricity on the planet and um, calculating blockchains. And so uh, we're gonna end up putting about probably 20 to 30% of, uh, of our electrical uh, outlet power into calculating the Bitcoin in order to hopefully find out what the, uh, the value would be and get that back so that we can fund this uh, project. Um, and as you can see, this has been gone through some very careful consideration um, and then we've decided that this process is a viable process to move forward with. Um, and so uh, there we pretty much have it. In, in the end, if you've got enough money to be able to pull out your blocks, then we can figure out the whole process and we'll have ourselves the, uh, the, the, the trip and it'll cost us about one Bitcoin to pull this off. So <clears throat> there we go. Is that my last slide? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> Great, perfect. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, is that working? Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my talk today is entitled, apparently, uh, The Physics of Ducklings. Aww. Now, before we move on, I just wanna point out that uh, this picture right here is not a duckling. I know a lot of people think it is a duckling, but it is not a duckling. Does anybody here know what a duckling is? I mean, physics-wise. Anybody have any ideas? Okay, well, that's what we're gonna to get to today. This is actually a baby duck. Slight, <laughs> slight difference, uh, but we'll talk about that in just a second. And also, I do also wanna point out that this was the first baby duck that was built in a laboratory. <laughs> and you can tell that because it was, uh, what's the medical term, bisected or? So they had cut it in half and reassembled it. Um, <laughs> and you can see that because uh, the bottom half was uh, put in, uh, uh, plexiglass so that you could look in and see the baby duck. All right, so uh, if you could please push on. Ah, excellent. Okay, so the way we make baby ducks, again, we're not talking about ducklings yet. We're going to talk about baby ducks. Um, uh, if you've, have you, anybody read this book? Yeah. My, my mother used to read this to me when I was a young boy. Um, and I particularly like the fact uh, it had pictures, didn't it, Brad? I think so. Those yeah. Things, yeah, she used to let me read the pictures while she showed me the words. Um, it was amazing. So what do we see here? Um, you know, we have uh, we have a a I'm assuming a mother duck, and then we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six baby ducks. Okay, the ducklings themselves are invisible. Now, this is a very important distinction. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, of all the duckling, sorry, of all the ducks in the universe, only about 4% are visible uh, to human beings, okay? That's what we call 
baby ducks. The ducklings are the invisible ones, <laughs> right? And, uh, and you see that wave pattern that's forming? That is a superposition of ducklings, okay? <laughs> and oftentimes, you know, you've seen things or what you think are lakes. You've seen lakes. Those aren't, those aren't actually lakes. Those are just superpositions of the ducklings that make it appear to reflect the light as if it was a surface of water. And in fact, we learned from our last talk that water doesn't even exist. We don't even need it. So. Okay, but that doesn't matter. The, the baby ducks, though, the question is, though, why are they swimming in formation? Um, and if they are going to swim in formation, what is the most efficient way for them to do that? And if we can find out how efficient it is, we can figure out how much effort we can save so that when we ourselves try to swim like baby ducks, uh, we can do it as efficiently as possible. Okay, so great practical applications. Next slide, please. Wow, okay. <laughs> if, I were, uh, if I were a different person, I would just skip this slide, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, I, you know, it is important for me to go through this in detail, but I do want to point out one very important thing, which is the uh, cold duck ratio. Okay, that's a CDR. And I, I, so you can write this as a ratio. We've cleverly divided out uh, the ducks. Uh, a, what does DA stand for again? Does anybody know what DA stands for again? Let's see here. I don't see it. In here, oh, the drag force. Okay, we've cleverly pulled out the drag force here so that it isn't actually a ratio anymore. But the cold dark ratio, cold duck ratio, um, <laughs> is, is uh, there's really two ways to calculate it. One way is to assume that you have a duck that's moving through a frictionless uh, superposition of ducklings, and then assume that the superposition of ducklings has no drag. And then we reference that in ratio two the drag force as if it did, where you have one duck or many. Am I making any sense whatsoever? Maybe we should do a little quiz. All right, no, I'm not gonna do a quiz. Okay, um, I, I wanna point out something that's often uh, not seen here is that uh, the CDR can exceed 100%, much like entropy. My students in thermal know this, that you can create uh, the CDR. It's more like a, a coefficient of performance, I think, than an efficiency per se. But I digress. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize this drag reduction coefficient or the cold dark ratio, cold duck ratio. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we have here, um, you know, uh, James Webb Space Telescope has uh, just started taking its first images. And uh, <laughs> And it's something that I think is, is not fully appreciated that uh, you can, in physics, we can often do things uh, at different scales. So you've probably seen it's very difficult to observe baby ducks. How many people saw a baby duck today? Nobody, okay, so it's very hard to observe. But we can take a $10 billion telescope, look into space and see the exact same physics and make the same sort of analysis, which we think can then extrapolate to baby ducks on Earth, okay? So that's what we're doing here. Uh, that's M31, which is uh, on the right-hand side, the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, James Webb's telescope, as you know, is uh, sensitive to the infrared. So we're actually seeing the, uh, the galactic uh, sort of wake as M31 moves through the galaxy, which is very confusing when you consider that M31 isn't in our galaxy because um, it's a separate galaxy. <laughs> but Again, that's not really the point of this talk. So, um, so you can see uh, in the two in the two cases that we have here. If you look on the left hand side, right, uh, there are more things on it than the one on the right. Okay. Um, in fact, I'm going to guess that the one on the right is a blow up of the section on the left. Who's in favor of that? Okay, good, excellent. All right, so we're going to zoom in. And we're gonna look at that and say, isn't that interesting how it, uh, it zooms to different scales? So that lets us know, because the, the physics looks the same at different scales, we can apply this to our baby ducks. So what's our main conclusion from this? Anyone? <laughs> ducks like to surf, that's the main conclusion. Okay, see a surfing duck in Australia. What this really says, everybody, is think twice before having baby ducks, because you don't get to surf anymore after that. Okay, next slide. 
my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Wow, this is, this is fantastic. How, am I out of time yet? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, all right. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna try to extrapolate this to the baby ducks. And I just wanna point out that if we're looking at this wave here that's going back like this, uh, the baby ducks are actually gonna cancel that out. And we call that uh, induction. Oh. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> call that induction and that makes it easier for them to swim on the superposition. <laughs> Uh, may I have the hopefully final slide? Hey, all right. Thank goodness. Oh, yeah. Question? Yes. Question. Oh, did you hear that, everybody? If they cancel out, why isn't it deduction? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I call it induction because uh, the, when they're like this, it's deduction. So I don't know. All right, thank you everybody. Oh boy, here we go. This is good. What? That was brutal. <laughs> thank you, John. I just came up here so I could look at this. Okay, I guess that is me. Good. Yeah. Okay. Am I ready? All right. Well, I am retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's a thing to celebrate for you too. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I retired is that after 30 years here, I, pre I perfected this. <laughs> I got so I could assign, make sure all my students had all their homework due at the same time. And exams, and exams. So, you know, you might think it would require a meeting that everybody has to attend before the semester. No, no, this is something that is almost genetic. And we, we just, no, we have our spidey senses going out, and we know when everybody is giving exams. So, without further ado, this is a gamification approach, and I don't know what that is. So, I'll be happy to talk about it at length. Please go on. That was very good. That, uh, that exceeds my, my skills at this. So, so here's a problem. The problem is trying to read this with my new glasses. Now, <laughs> this is a dynamic priority assignment technique for streams with M comma K in that order, in that order, M comma K firm deadlines. Now, what is M comma K? Well, M stands for month. K is the wave number. <laughs> now, why is a wave number important here? What is a wave? A wave is a wave that goes through the month. And where the wave is high, you don't have to square the wave. This is not quantum mechanics. However, the wave is high, there's a high probability that other people are giving exams and homework. And so that's what the K is for. It's to allow you to hit the peak probability that you will be assigning your homework, your exam at the same time as others. And this is a paper that um, I wrote about it uh, before I changed my name. <laughs> that's how you know it was one of my papers. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there is a solution on the horizon, but before that, here's the real problem, is that multiple professors have to align their homework due dates, you know, without talking to each other. As I said, it's genetic. We do this. That's why we become professors. We are pre-programmed. You know, it's like you show up and everybody at the same time, they go to a restaurant, everybody else is. We don't even have to arrange things. It's great. 
So most professors need to align homework without talking to each other and without making it seem like we're doing it on purpose, even though in your hearts you know we are. <laughs> so the solution is gamification. <laughs> Gamification, as we all know, is based on 80s video games, something that I know much about. I played Rogue for many, many, many hours at night in the laboratories of the Laboratory for Astrophysics and Space Science at the University of Colorado. This is the night Rogue was on their computers. You sneak in, you play the games with everybody else is wondering, well, where did the Venus probe go? But that's okay. So gamification, based on 80s uh, video games, let's take a look. Oh my gosh, this is such cool stuff. Oh my gosh. We launch missiles to destroy incoming assignments with rogue due dates. You know, the reasons that your professors, if you ask them, can we move that assignment back a little bit? No. <laughs> No, because we've already, we, they just know we'll shoot it down. It's not going to happen. Okay, also, we inflate assignments to the point that they always overlap. Oh, this, this is a weak group assignment. At the same time, you have a weak group assignment in every other class from history to molecular biology. We always, we always do that. And you can see there, this is... Notice what this graphic really is. These are students. And, and the goal is to dig them deeper and deeper into the hole so they can't possibly get out. <laughs> Next slide. More examples. Oh, this is cool. This is cool. Now, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this on the left here. I notice if you stare at that, the blocks change their orientation. <laughs> and that's the best sort of assignment you can have because you give an assignment like this, you say you want one thing, but then you grade it on something entirely different. <laughs> so this, this is where I learned most about what I came to master. Now, scaling up, definitely you have to scale up. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but whatever it is, you have to do it. I, I didn't get to play this one. I, by this time, I was, I don't know, I spent about five years trying to get portal to work. So <laughs> what's next here? That's it? Well, I don't know, I may have taken up too much time or too little time, but being a professor, I don't care. So if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> Dr. Engelfield. There you go. All right. Good afternoon. So today I'm going to tell you about the famous cheetah versus bear versus shark problem. Of course, it's not really about cheetahs, bears, and sharks. But before we start, a little poll. Cheetah, team cheetah. Team bear. Team shark. All right. All right, we'll come back. We'll see who's right at the end. All right, next slide. All right. So as we all know, cheetah, bear, and shark are three models 
a frisbee throw. <laughs> All right. Who is Team Cheetah? Team, team Cheetah. Demonstrate the motion involved in the cheetah throw. All right. All right. Very good. And of course, bear and shark are obvious. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, the point is, we have this dimensionless parameter, mu. And in terms of that dimensionless parameter, uh, different things happen here. All right, as you can see, slides versus rolls, pins, et cetera. All right, next. Here we have a top view looking down at the frisbee, the cheetah throw. What does everybody notice? Jumping out at you. It's just, it's, it should just, right? <laughs> Looks like a bowling ball, yes. All right. What else? All right. All right. Uh, We notice the oil lines on the Frisbee. <laughs> For whatever reason, are nearly perpendicular to the lane surface. All right, next slide. <laughs> All right. Oil patterns and evolution. The game of Frisbee ultimately <laughs> evolved into the modern sport we now call bowling. <laughs> and the three different Frisbee throws actually evolved into the three different strategies uh, for, for bowling, it's illustrated here. All right. So over on the uh, Right, we have a cheetah shark bear. And on the left, we have some lines going into bowling pins. Okay, next slide. <laughs> right, yeah. Now, now we've answered the question, right? <laughs> As we can all see, the correct answer was bear. And that is because point C is nearly on axis with the end vector here, perpendicular to the lane surface as predicted for the bear frisbee throw slash bowling stroke. So who was bear? All right, well, congratulations. Your intuition is very good today. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, that's it. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Uh, I'm, oh, okay. I must say that I am very disappointed that our Bostonian did not give us an example of how to say cheetah, bear, <laughs> and shot. <laughs> but whatever. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing this afternoon? <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today I'm going to talk to you about high altitude transport of atmospheric pollutants. And I must say that many of these pollutants are coming from three primary sources. <laughs> and those three primary sources are Chapman, Navier, and Stokes. And you may have heard of Navier Stokes as being kind of connected together. That's because they're pollutants are actually catalysts for one another that drive a recurring 
chemical interaction that just eventually reduces the entire atmosphere of the planet to a thin skim of sludge. <laughs> this is not the atmospheric talk you were expecting. <laughs> because this is not the crisis you're used to hearing about. This Navy or Strokes crisis, they've been hiding it from you this whole time. And I am here to tell you the truth. Next slide, please. So here we have the entire atmosphere. Uh, we have pressure measured on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. So what you see, is that we're going from way up in the Arctic down through the temperate zones to the equator. The red line is Navier. The green line is Stokes. And you can see that up there at a pressure of about 250 um, um, H Pascals, we have... <laughs> Navier and Stokes combining, right? And that is as we come down from the Arctic regions, it's a bit north of here. So it's right around the Canadian US border where this really is an important problem. And already we're seeing atmospheric collapse at those latitudes. This is a serious, serious problem. The, uh, Inset in the upper right is critically important, but really beyond the scope of this audience. So we'll skip it and move to the next one. So, stratospheric ozone is formed at tropical latitudes through this Navier Stokes process. So we saw in the previous slide that we have it uh, have problems at like mid heights, but at uh, in the stratosphere we have problems when we're at much much lower latitudes in the tropics. Now some of you may be aware that between the tropics, that's a really special place on the Earth where the sun can at times be actually at the zenith. Nowhere else on Earth outside of the tropics can the sun ever be at the zenith. So that means that this process doesn't happen anywhere else because the sun is never at the zenith and molecules are deeply attuned to whether something's at the zenith or just kind of overhead somewhere. <laughs> so the sun shines and it shines onto O2 and the Navier Stokes interaction produces this catalyst that then makes O3. Now that doesn't sound like it's really truly terrible until I tell you that O3 is way heavier than O2. It's like 1.5 times heavier. <laughs> it's like 150% weightier. Where do weightier things go? Down. <laughs> This is what I'm telling you about the collapse of the atmosphere into sludge. Next. <laughs> the solution, as is always the case, horses. No matter what the problem is, the solution is horses. In this case, the horse can tell you telepathically which latitude is the safest latitude to inhabit to avoid this Navier Stokes collapse of the atmosphere into sludge? And the production of horse manure gives you an anti catalyst to the Navier Stokes interaction, which you can then distribute widely and counteract the sludge forming action of Navier and Stokes. However, it's really, really super important that you insert the horse into the places where the, 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 the sludge formation has already occurred. So you can see we have particular latitudes where we already have this problem so badly 
that people are leaving those areas in droves to avoid the sludge. If we insert horses into those areas, we can potentially solve the problem and avoid this entire crisis. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've tried this. We've tried it at a couple of different heights, a couple of different altitudes, in particular, the place where the O2 was turning into ozone. And we took a horse <laughs> and we attached it to a high altitude balloon. <laughs> or two, or five, and we flew it up to the region where that Navier-Stokes uh, catalyst reaction was producing the heavy, heavy, heavy O3. We were not successful. But we're gonna try again anyway. Our next attempt will be actually using a mini horse with sneakers. <laughs> because we think that the sneakers will really allow it to navigate that altitude much better than a regular horse just in shoes. <laughs> Next slide, please. Are there any questions? No horses were harmed in the making of this science experiment, but the horses report that the view is exquisite. <laughs> Alyssa. They have the most incredible helmets you've ever seen. They're extraordinary. And they have little speakers inside so that from the ground, we can just keep going, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Do you know that question actually belongs in arts and humanities? So I'll move on. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. Let's uh, give our contestants, esteemed faculty members, another round of applause. Well done. Four out of five of you may remain on the tenured faculty line. Uh, our seminarians are uh, tallying their individual results. So Eric's still whittling away. Eric, what classes are you taking this semester? <laughs> yeah. Dr. Inglefield is signing off on graduation forms. I got this one, this one, this one. Carson's still working. Yeah, your research professor gave an excellent talk. Traditionally, the, the trophy goes to the best presentation and the best slides. Um, but I know from experience, just gets like a nice job, buddy, kind of acknowledgement. All right, we've got all the results. They're sitting here. All right. Now I have to, this is high stakes edition. I didn't know you guys were all gonna stay to watch me do this. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get 
This is so exciting. This has never happened before. <laughs> so, <laughs> frankly, the world is a crazy enough place right now. You should share. Congratulations, Dr. Carroll, Dr. Carroll. And the best slide award goes to Dr. Palin. Nice job. All right. Well done, judges, not putting your names on your judging forms. I'll show these to faculty and see if they can pick out your handwriting. All right. Have a happy spring break. A week, two weeks from now. Gigi's senior seminar, followed a week after by Carson's senior seminar. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you all later. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>